You have to stay there for a few moments. <laughs> I think you thought my my theology had changed. <laughs> I hope it's been deepened. I hope it's been more, more, more rounded, more complete, more comprehensible, more uh, able to fit together. You know, that's the beautiful thing about uh, biblical doctrine, theology, is that it all every doctrine affects the other, and they all come together so beautifully. Amen. And, uh, thank you, brother, for the confidence you've placed in me. I'm, I'm honored. Um, we'd like to. Uh, uh, once again, say thank you to the New Testament Baptist Church for your support these many years. And uh, we did come in 2001. We actually broke down, if you all remember. Yes. Uh, we were coming to visit you all. We broke down in Elizabethtown, not Pennsylvania. That's where we're in our address. Our address is Elizabethtown, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, but Elizabethtown, Kentucky. And Brother Larry, bless his heart, uh, uh, to befriend him. A missionary family can be challenging times. <laughs> And uh, we had our, our transmission, if I remember, it was repaired during the list. Those little vans were horrible. Ours went out three times. Um, <laughs> so uh, and that's how we, we came to meet you. Providence. We are still meeting. Just to remind you, you guys were still in that little building over there. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, there were less pews in it than just the one oh, yeah. side here. It was very reduced and, and uh, it was very comfy. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I don't think it would have been very COVID appropriate, huh? Right. <laughs> uh, six foot was from the pulpit almost to the back door, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, those uh, those days have passed. My family was last with me, though Bertito and Ruth and uh, were with me at a conference of just a couple few years ago here. Uh, my family hasn't been back to the area since 2011. Wow. So that, that means that the 10 years have passed, and so obviously there's uh, everyone's getting old except the parents, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy my, my, my children get to enjoy. I'm sorry my two sons that were with us in the conference have now gone to Alabama, and, uh, and so we'll be seeing them here in about a, a couple of weeks before we return to Mexico. Um, what a continued national prayer. First of all, we uh, just want to ask for a prayer for a, a, a particular family issue. Um, I don't have liberty to, to, do, to, to say more about it at this time, but uh, we would request your prayer and, and that, that the Lord would meet his needs, give wisdom, and, uh, and, and bless our home and family. Um, and uh, we would ask you to pray for our unconverted children. And uh, we're thankful for the ones the Lord has saved. And we give him honor and glory for that. And uh, in spite of his home, in spite of his father, in spite of his mother, and in spite of the identity nature that he received uh, first through Adam and then through his own father, uh, the Lord choose, chose to save him. Uh, who's been Amen. He is blessed. And we have others that are not into the fold of the Lord yet, but uh, we pray and ask you to pray for them. We uh, want to make mention uh, for the works in, in Mexico. We're uh, uh, very grateful. COVID has, has greatly affected us in the sense that uh, the country was closed down. There was a, a long number period of months that we couldn't get out of Mexico. There was no, no leaving uh, with the COVID. Um, and uh, we uh, were actually scheduled to travel to Oaxaca, Makai, and I to the wedding of Brother Pablo. You would have met Brother Pablo, Hermano Pablo. Uh, he's now almost close to 30 years old, and the Lord provided him a wife, and we were going to go down and officiate. And, uh, but uh, the community closed, closed up the uh, access all to all people without the village, and so the responsibility fell upon Brother Guadalupe's shoulders, and he was on the phone asking me for help and help on how, <laughs> how to do that. That's a blessing. Yep. Uh, he, uh, he, had, uh, he, he was blessed in that. And so uh, we've not been we've not been to Oaxaca for uh, since uh, prior to the COVID. I'll share a quick blessing with you, especially since you know some of the brethren from the mountain where it is. Um, when we were getting ready for surgery, I was operated on about uh, December fifteenth, and my wife may correct that, but uh, December fifteenth of uh, uh, two thousand nineteen, and and uh, we got uh, a text that day that the brethren had left in the in the wee hours of the morning had left the village and. Three of the men came up to pray with me before I had Amen. surgery all the way to Mexico City. So it took them four hours to get 
to get to Oaxaca, and then from Oaxaca, it's about another six and a half, seven hours, and then we got to, they got to Mexico City being country folk, they didn't know how to get around, it took them about three hours to get from the bus station to where we were staying, and uh, uh, we, we hugged each other's neck, and, and uh, they, they brought me a love offering at that time, and uh, they, uh, uh, they, we, they had a prayer for me, and, and uh, so that was, a, that was very touching. Amen. We uh, are, are grateful for that. That's the kind of men that, that the Lord has raised up there and my family has rubbed shoulders with all these years. Um, we uh, uh, ask prayer for the work in, in, in Chetumana. They have a mission in Comalcalco, Tabasco. And uh, they have scheduled, uh, uh, they've been working that for probably four years now, more or less, three to four years. And uh, they have recently built a small building, a simple building. Um, but they scheduled a, a building dedication two different times during the COVID, uh, the COVID situation. They had to be canceled. Brother Narciso just recently uh, asked me when I was coming back, and I think they're trying to reschedule it, and would like like uh, like uh, us to participate as well. And so pray for uh, pray for the work in Comalcalco, Tabasco. Pray for Brother Narciso and his family. And uh, uh, the men, the, the ordained men have, have, have were proved extensively. Uh, and I don't even, that's, that's sort of a subjective word amongst us, subjectively, but they were, they were definitely proved before we laid hands on them. Uh, the, the men have been, have been examples. Amen. And uh, they have been faithful and uh, they, they have been constant and, and they, they've been diligent. And, I know that they would uh, appreciate your prayers, and um, the uh, uh, there's some other things to comment, but we'll, we'll leave that for another time. Um, I'd like to invite you tonight to open your Bibles, please. Open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 119. Psalms, chapter 119, verse 65 and following. We want to encourage you to continue to be active in your evangelism. We're blessed by it. We'd like to encourage you as a church to be praying about a particular nation that you could pray about, that you could sort of adopt a nation as your own and make it a nation where uh, there's not a day or a service goes by that you do not pray for that people. And uh, uh, that God you would pray that God would raise up laborers if they're without the scripture, that God would give them the scripture, uh, that God would send forth laborers. And uh, we like to encourage this congregation to take that step of, 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 of focus and maturity, uh, of, of compassion. You, you know, in, in, our, in our youth, we're so self-absorbed. And it's right. easy as we grow older, and especially as some of the burdens of life are lifted, it's easy to come, we have to, we have to pour ourselves out to our children, but then there's a tendency to become self-absorbed. But let's not, let's not use the latter days of our life or even this ministry and it's, it's, as it as comes to more maturity uh, for, for self-indulgence or self-pleasure or, or uh, just self-gratification. But let, let's, let's look, let, let, let us lift up our eyes and look on the fields. And I'm going to preach that tonight. But let us lift up our eyes, look on the fields, and ask the Lord to give us a nation that is that is has not been reached with the gospel. That that uh, that has uh, 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 that perhaps doesn't even have the word of God in their language. I don't have it with me tonight, um, but I have in my house what I call my tribal Bible. Have I ever shared that here with? with the New Testament Baptist in the years that we've been here, my tribal Bible. And, um, you know, um, I, I don't know if you've ever looked inside of a tribal Bible, but can you imagine what life is like without one verse of Scripture in your language and amongst your nation? You have to say you don't know anything really about that. Right. Like that, is just, right. that. That is just an experience that none of us have... Right. I, I, I mentioned somewhere the last couple of days, I don't remember where I did, I grew up on the edge of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. If you know anything about Lancaster County, I went to school in, I went to school in Dauphin County, but Lancaster, Pennsylvania uh, is, was a strong Amish Mennonite area, um, much more than even around here. And um, 
and uh, for generations. And it's very common amongst them that they'll, they'll, they'll get big billboards on their farms and they'll put up there, uh, come unto me all you the labor heavy, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Or they might put up uh, uh, Acts 1631 or they might put up uh, uh, first, uh, first Timothy 115 or, or, or some text. Uh, I think that's a blessing. I, w- I wish I knew the truth, but, but the, tr- the fact is, it doesn't matter if the truth is on a billboard or we're reading it right out of here. It's still the same verse of scripture. It's still the truth. Amen. And, uh, you know, you know, uh, I, I've grown up as ignorant as I was of the scriptures when the Lord saved me. There, there was testimonies all around me. But this tribal Bible is a Bible, but it does not have any writing inside of it. Hmm. And so when I open this tribal Bible, there's nothing there. Hmm. And so I'll ask someone in the congregation, would you please read John 3.16 in this tribal Bible? Well, they'll open the text and then they, all they see are just blank pages. You know, it's a book. It looks... They just open up and look for John 3, 16. It doesn't exist in there. Will you read Romans 5, 8? Will you, will you read uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22 in this Bible? And uh, obviously, we don't even know what it is really in the, in the truest sense. And, and I don't want to minimize the, the depravity of Americans and the, the doctrine of total depravity of man. But imagine living, being born growing up, living your whole life in a nation where there is not the Word of God. It does not exist. Mm -hmm. There are still nations, there are still ethnic groups like that. Sure. Young people, when the Lord saves you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields. Be used of the Lord. Amen. Yield yourself to Christ. Be a messenger, be an instrument of blessing. Um, he that planteth is in anything. He that watereth is in anything. It's God who gives the increase. Amen. But still, there must be instruments by whom others will believe. And uh, we, we want to just encourage you along that line. Um, if uh, if the Lord would uh, would lead, we could pray for the Maldai Islands off the southwest tip of India. We could pray for the nation of Indonesia, the largest populated Muslim nation in the world, over 13,000 islands, um, and not all are inhabited, but many are, and uh, a nation that has uh, well over uh, well over 600 different languages, if you mm. can even begin to imagine that, and uh, the, the challenges. Uh, but uh, as we just went through the missions conference, uh, the Lord's resources are sufficient to do His work. And, Amen. And uh, pray about that. Pray about that. Uh, you might want to call instead of taking a rifle, uh, excuse me, a shotgun approach to missions in the mm-hmm. world. Maybe getting something laser focused like a rifle and and, and aiming toward it and praying and laboring and, and uh, really focusing in and uh, being an instrument of blessing. Um, I remember one church in, uh, in Homa, Louisiana, and uh, that dear brother, uh, he is a, he, he's a grace man. And uh, do you know anybody in Homa, Louisiana? Uh, you do? It's down in the bayou, man. It's down, down, down there. No. Um, but uh, they, they took on a burden of vision uh, for a West African nation, I'm, and the nation just slipped my mind. I'm going to look here quick and do a cheat sheet um, and see if I can pull it out of the hat here. My wife is saying, you, you know what nation that is. Um, uh, it was the nation of Ghana, thank you. It was the nation of Ghana. And they took on this, this focused burden, and uh, uh, even some of them began to make trips, and uh, they began to, to, to do some evangelistic uh, publishing the gospel uh, there in Ghana and offering a Bible course. And uh, they were receiving literally dozens of postcards after a period of time, dozens of postcards of people soliciting a Bible st- study course. And uh, they would send them back across. Obviously, there was some financial resource there. 
and uh, but uh, they would send them over and and uh, you know they thought this big big church in in, in Houma, Louisiana was having this great international ministry. Well, it was it was a church about the size of the church here, <laughs> and uh, they just had a vision. They were in of the Lord and they began to pray, and the Lord opened the door, and, and uh, finally they actually prayed out, uh, uh, prayed out at least one, maybe two men who went to Ghana and uh, took up those contacts and followed those up and were involved in church planning. Um, and uh, that was just, a, that was back in, in, in the 90s. And uh, we've somewhat lost contact with that, but uh, what, a, what a blessing, what a testimony. Amen. What an opportunity. And uh, may the Lord uh, direct in those things. Psalm chapter 119, verse number 65. Um, I'm going to read verse 65 and following. Please follow along in your, in, in, in your Bible. And uh, the scripture says, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord. I like that. Mm -hmm. David said, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant. O Lord, according unto thy word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good, teach me thy statutes. Amen. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me, Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Amen. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. And I'm taking tonight this phrase, that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me, and I'd like to bring a message tonight, afflicted according to the faithfulness of God. Notice, if you will, here in our text in Psalm 119, in verse, uh, uh, starting in verse 65, in verse 67, David says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Amen. He comes down there and, and uh, uh, he uh, uh, says in verse 7, uh, there's one other one I'm missing here, help me find it. Quickly, the word afflict me, for I was afflicted, I went astray. Um, 67. 67, that was 67. Uh, 71. Uh, 71, it's good for me. Thank you, Brother Larry. It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Amen. And then he comes down have, after having stated and manifested, thou hast dealt well with thy servant. Thou hast been, thou hast, thou hast uh, done good, and thou art good, and has and doest good. And then David comes down in verse seventy-five and says that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. And I'd like us to briefly meditate upon that 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 subject tonight. Afflicted according to the faithfulness of God. When we go to the Lord in prayer, Heavenly Father, tonight. We stand before Thee, not in our own merits and not in our own righteousness. But Father, we come into Your presence and we come boldly because the righteousness of Christ is ours. We have been declared righteous. And Father, our sins have been once and for all removed forever from Your presence. And Father, we thank You tonight that we are totally accepted in the Beloved. And we ask tonight, Father, that you would send your spirit among us first to exalt Jesus Christ. Father, that you would teach us the word, that you would teach us, Father, the, the blessedness of affliction, because you in affliction, you in faithfulness do afflict. And Father, we ask that the spirit of God would have liberty, that he would move, he would teach, he would instruct, that he would convict, that he would grant repentance and faith. Father, that you would bless your people, nourish and strengthen us in the word, feed our souls, and Father, save, save for your honor and glory the unconverted among us tonight. We pray for this, this uh, prayer request that was brought 
uh, fourth by Brother Junior. Father, we pray that you'd meet the needs there tonight. Pray that, that uh, you'd strengthen the hearts. We pray that you would save un the unconverted, that you would, Father, direct this affliction in their lives for the salvation of souls. Amen. We pray to Father tonight, even for me, Father, that you would strengthen me, my family, save my unconverted children. We pray, Father, that you'd use me for your honor and glory. We thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Affliction is a strange reality in the life of believers. Right. It's strange because man by nature believes that affliction is a sign of divine displeasure. When someone is under the uh, is under affliction, they're 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 in grave affliction, this strange affliction. We by nature think there's some sin, there's something not right, there's a there's a falling away, there's a departure from the Lord, there is disobedience, there's disapproval on the part of God. In fact, the natural man thought is if man is loved by God, saved by him, kept by him, blessed by him, he will not have affliction, he will not have trials and sorrows in life. In reality, this is the principle belief of those who promote the modern day prosperity gospel. You're right. Amen. If you're right with God, you'll be rich and not poor. Mm. You'll be healthy and not sick. You'll be happy without affliction and tribulation in your life. However, with a very superficial examination of the Word of God, we find that there are a multitude of persons beloved by God, saved by His grace in truth from sin, that have suffered greatly and whose lives have been afflicted with trials that have pressed them. Amen. Measure. You're right. Could, could I just remind us of a few tonight? How can we overlook starting with Job? Yeah. Starting with Job. A godly man. There was none like him in the in the in the east. He feared God, he shewed evil. The Bible tells us he was a diligent father, concerned for his spiritual happiness and well-being of his children. He was prospered. And God said to Satan one day, have you not considered my servant Job? Mm -hmm. And we read down through the, the, the early chapters of Job and we see the tremendous, as God granted permission, we see the tremendous losses in his life. Right. Those losses are going to come to all of our lives sooner or later. You're right. Mark it down. There's no one who will be exempt from it. Amen. That's right. But we see there the loss of the death of his sons and daughters, all ten of them. We see the the uh, the the, uh, uh, the loss of his animals and, and and all of his prosperity, his camels and and so on. Can you imagine having three thousand camels? How in the world do you do you satisfy the thirst of that many camels? Right. And according to God's permission, Satan came. And Satan would have destroyed Job to the to the to the maximum. God did not give him permission for that. When those judgments fell upon him, and he was he 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 fell he fell into a, 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 a no doubt a shock a stupor a, 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 a how how could such things happen to someone? I fear God. I hate evil. I'm a leader in my community. I try to apply the word of God. And it says that Job did not sin against God. He did Amen. not charge God foolishly. I like what it says there in my Spanish Bible that he did not, he did not attribute to God 
despropósito alguno. That God had done anything without definite purpose. He Amen. Did something against God. Amen. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Well, you'll have to learn this in your Christian life, dear, dear, dear saint of God. No matter your age, when those trials will come, you're going to have to learn that God is as good when He gives as when He takes away. Amen. Right. That's all right. He's, he's equally good. And we go through the whole story there of Job. We could, we could speak of Joseph. Can you imagine a young man losing the primary years of his life? And I don't want to minimize his childhood and the, 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 the lower part of his adolescence. I don't want to minimize his more mature years and his, his, his senior years. Can you imagine from the, he was hated in his home. He was, he was hated in his home. He, he was despised because he had believed the word that God had given him concerning prophetic events. He believed God and his brethren persecuted him. They hated upon him. They, they planned his, 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 his demise. And finally, they cast him into a pit and he sold to the, to the, to the, to the uh, uh, those who were going to, uh, uh, to Egypt. And uh, we see from the age of 17 years old to 30 years old, he was under a cloud, a constant cloud, abandoned by family, all alone, a foreigner. Many times we don't stop to take into consideration. If I ask you in between 17 and 30, what events happened in your life? And you're going to tell me most of the important events of your life happened in those years. Mm -hmm. The Lord saved me. The Lord called me to the ministry. The Lord gave me my life purpose, vocation, if you will. The Lord favored me with a wife. The Lord gave us at least one, probably uh, one child at that time, before by 30 years old. The Lord sent me to Mexico. And what happened in your life between 17 and 30? Do you not appreciate what we're reading in the life of Joseph, how he was under this burden of constant tribulation? Mm -hmm. We could speak about Abel, and time's going to get away if I don't keep moving. Speak about Abel, hated by his brother, persecuted, martyred. We could speak about the father, the parents of Moses. Those who feared God, and God blessed their home with a, a young boy. <clears throat> And uh, his name was Moses and how they hid him and protected him and tried to keep him from the, the, the evil desires of Pharaoh and his decree that the children be killed. And how they, with, with great prayer and earnestness, they built this little ark and they cast him onto the waters thinking, oh, what shall be of my son? Oh, commend him to the Lord. Amen. You don't think that that's not an affliction for a mother and a father? Right. That is. Amen. We can speak of the 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 the, uh, uh, the people of Israel in Egypt four hundred years. We can speak about Abraham on Mount Moriah. Can you imagine a man? He's almost one hundred and twenty years old or thereabouts, and God tells him to take his son, his only son, whom he loved, the one that he waited to. He was one hundred years old. That promised son of him, he would become be the father of many nations. Take thou thy son, thy only son. And offer him there on, a, on, a, on, on Mount Moriah. What an affliction. We can speak about Jacob. Jacob, when he lost his two sons, Joseph and Benjamin, he couldn't be consoled. He was, he was heart sick. Uh, 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 years had passed. Uh, uh, Thirteen years had passed that he hadn't seen his son and he could not be consoled and he was so protective of his youngest son for the very same reason. Can you imagine the anguish of heart of right. Jacob in those moments? How about David when he was persecuted by his, his own uh, father-in-law Saul? Yeah. How, how would you like to be? Uh, some of us are blessed with, with wonderful father-in-laws. Um, but, but the, we see here that he had an intention uh, uh, to, to murder David. It was, it was his heart's desire. It was what he longed to do. Can you imagine the, per, the, the, the anguish, the, the, the affliction? How about David and the rebellion and insurrection of his son Absalom? 
Oh, that's one many Christian parents can identify with, can they? Right. My son, my son, Absalom, oh, my son, Absalom, would God I died for thee. The affliction of wayward, the affliction of, 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 of children who turn from truth and turn from the scriptures and turn from the knowledge of God. And even he remounted, uh, mounted an insurrection against his beloved, his beloved father. How about, how about, how about Naomi? Right. Do you remember Naomi married to Elimelech? She had two sons. In a time of famine, they left Bethlehem, the house of bread. And they went out towards the towards Moab, to Moab and, and, and trying to uh, 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 trying to overcome the, the the lack of resources. And they come to Moab and, and uh, 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 her two sons marry, but in, in an unexpected providence, Elimelech dies and her two sons die, and she is just broken, and they're all, all alone except for her daughter-in-law, and she's in foreign land. What shall she do? How shall she live? How shall she continue? She was so heartbroken. She said to her daughter-in-laws, please turn back to your father's house. Please turn back to your, your gods, plural. Turn back to your gods. And Orpah did return. Naomi said, no, I'll go with you. Your God shall be my God. I Amen. Believe she, I believe she was a regenerate woman. Amen. God had saved her. Yeah. And she returned. She got back and the people come out to receive her and they didn't know who the young lady was and they recognized Naomi, but where's, where's Elimelech, where's her sons? They aren't to be found. And she said, please, please don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Yeah. The Lord had dealt bitterly. Yeah. Had dealt bitterly with me. I want to, I don't want to criticize Naomi. Right. But I just want to say this, you know, many times we don't understand the providence of God. And what's like, what seems like a bitter circumstance right now, she didn't know that her daughter-in-law would That's marry right. Moaz and she would become, is it the grandmother or great-grandmother? Great-grandmother. Uh, great-grandmother of King David. One of the purest and clearest types of Christ in the Old Testament. Lord, that thou better live with me. Right. How about Timothy? The affliction of his frequent stomach ailments. <laughs> Those of you who have physical ailments know that uh, physical ailments can be an affliction. How about Lazarus? Huh. Can you imagine? Can you imagine eating the crumbs that fall from a rich man's table? Now, I have to be honest and say he might have eaten better than we do by eating those crumbs. But the scripture tells us that the dogs came and they licked his wounds. This was his experience. You want to talk about an affliction. Incurable. Whether they were incurable because they didn't have the funds or incurable because it was a, a disease that could not be treated. But the dogs came and licked his sores. What an affliction. Poverty can be an affliction. Amen. How can we overlook those in Hebrews chapter 11? How can we overlook them? Can I, can I read for you? I have it written here in Spanish, and so I have to read it in English. Forgive me for that. But notice what the scripture says. It says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world. Notice what the scripture says. The world was not worthy. Mm. Amen. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. That's one of the reasons I'm, my heart is satisfied being a Baptist. Amen. Because our Baptist people, that is the testimony they live for truth's sake. How can we not mention these? Amen. How, how about having to flee to the mountains? How about having to flee to the cavern? How, how about having to, 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 uh, uh, to clothe yourself with the, the most uh, 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 simple uh, skins and trying to stay warm and, and trying, to, trying to stay clothed and so on? The <clears throat> Bible says the world is not worthy of such. How about Saul of Tarsus? You see that he was a persecutor beforehand. 
We're not going to take the time, but 2 Corinthians 11 tells us that he was a man who was greatly afflicted for cause of truth. Greatly afflicted. And I'm not going to read that. But I must hasten to also include our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He says he was despised and rejected of men, a man of truth. In Spanish it says there when it says uh, uh, despreciado, it says in English about the, uh, he was despised, rejected, a man, uh, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, it says in English. Uh, it says there in Spanish, it says that he was experienced in brokenness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> i give you another perspective. Amen. You ever stop to think that? To look at Jesus' prayer life over there in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews with strong crying and prayers. There, there was nothing elevated or exalted about our Lord, though he was worthy to be exalted, but he was a very humble man. He identified with brokenness and and a contract broken heart, God does not despise. And it wasn't over his own sin, but but he had a, a proper perspective. But look at our Lord, look at the afflictions. And uh, uh, they esteemed him as stricken, smitten with God. That's what I told you the natural thought is. The unbe unbelieving esteemed him as stricken, smitten of God. But yet he was afflicted according to the faithfulness of God. Brethren, I sustain by the authority of the scriptures, by the divine inspiration I have here in, the, in my Bible, that the people of faith from antiquity to the present, that, that affliction is a reality in all of our lives. Amen. It may be strange to us, it may be strange to the world, but the Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, 1, there is a great cloud of witnesses Amen. who give testimony to the fact that God is faithful even in affliction. Amen. Now I hasten just to add that that, that, that great cloud of witnesses is not a, a great cloud like many like to paint it today. They get to heaven and now they're up there watching and cheering us on Amen. like cheerleaders. That is a totally irresponsible interpretation of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. Right. The Bible says that there is a great cloud of witnesses and they witness to the fact that the principle of faith, all that is found in Hebrews 11, the principle of faith is the most blessed principle by which you and I can live. Right. Amen. Even in great affliction, even in, in, in loss of home, even in, 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 in great pain and great sorrow, they have given testimony, as Jesus said, I, peace I leave with you, by peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, giveth, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart uh, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Mm -hmm. Can I share a personal testimony here regarding an affliction that I recently came through? And thank you for your prayers and thank you for your compassion towards me and my family. But as you'll remember, in September of 2019, all of, and, 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 and just, just out of nowhere, I began to have these insupportable, uh, uh, these unsustainable uh, 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 headaches. And uh, I thought, well, my muscles, something's not right. You know, as you get older, your muscles are tight. It just affects all your neck and your head. And so I, I started, I, I got like four or five consecutive days of massages. I started to take some home remedies by Dr. Lucas. Dr. Lucas is our one over in Milo, Oaxaca. He's the one that's always using some kind of herb to cure this and that. And, and we were out picking weeds. And uh, I call the weeds are herbs and making teas and other things that uh, uh, to, uh, I had four or five visits in September, four or five visits to a chiropractor. I had an analysis of blood, of urine excrement. I went to see a general doctor. I went to see a cardiologist. I went to see a neurologist. Uh, I had a, a simple CT done uh, uh, and, and, and a host of other injections and, and oral medicines. And there was absolutely no result. 
October came and I was in Oaxaca, my wife and family were in Chitumada, about 850 miles distance, and I, I, I returned uh, on a flight to, to, to get to be back with my wife. In fact, Lydia and I returned and uh, we went back to uh, be with uh, Hermano Juanita, that's, that's um, Sister Heather, uh, Hermano Juanita. And if you know anything about my wife, she just thought those Oaxaca women didn't know how to give, give home remedies. And so she, she cooked up all of her own remedies and gave them to me and tried to get me over the hump and tried to get me past all of the, the, the severe pain and discomfort. And, and uh, I, I took some other medicines, received some other injections. I thought, well, maybe my pain is being caused by a tooth. And so I went to see a dentist because the pain was, was up in my head. And perhaps it, uh, I took some more med medicines that he recommended to him, an injection, and there was no result. November came and I went to see an ENT, is that how we say in English? An ENT doctor, and they took some medicines and they did an a, a MRI, and they did another type of, of, of scan. And, and there was some problem was detected, but there wasn't anybody of capacity or with the ability to, to treat my case in the whole state of Quintana Bro where I live. And so the ENT recommended that I go back and see her professor. He was a, uh, in, in Mexico City. You have to understand that's, that's about 15 hours driving. And uh, it was, it's a long distance. It's two, almost two and a half hours flying. And uh, she recommended I go see, uh, go see him as a specialist in Mexico City. They found, in, 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 in time it wasn't immediate, but they found a tumor in my S espinoid. Is that how we say that in English, Brother Larry? Espinoid, my, 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 my nasal, uh, my espinoid nasal passage. It was all the way in the back. And uh, uh, it was behind my, my left eye and it had filled the whole cavity and uh, it was it was growing out. It was putting pressure. It was deformed, deforming the in interior part of my head. And obviously, I'm sure that's what was causing much of the pressure. And uh, uh, and 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 in and, and my head, according to the studies that he he did, that this tumor had grown around the carotid arteries, the arteries that feed the brain. There's another principal artery that sends blood to the brain. I don't remember the name of it now. Do you remember the name of that artery? That it passes right through there, and the tumor had grabbed the hole. Mm. And uh, so we made the trip, and and uh, made a couple trips, and, and and finally December came. He had me take some more medicines, and have another uh, uh, scan with the color contrast and different things. And so in December of 2019, we programmed. Uh, we. Uh, uh, for the 18th, I said the 15th or the 18th of December, my my wife and I, we went to Mexico City and we spent, spent almost two and a half weeks there. And uh, my surgery was so delicate. They were so concerned that when they tried to take the tumor out that it would cause a, a bleed, that they would cut the artery, that they had uh, uh, had had five surgeons at my, five surgeons at my surgery of different things. And the... The day came for us, and uh, the night we went to bed, we actually celebrated our, our anniversary, our, would have been our 29th anniversary about two weeks early, not knowing if I was going to survive that. And, and uh, according to the, uh, the prognosis, it was a very good chance we would not survive. And, and I got up in the middle of the night, and uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me, these may be my last hours on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm thinking, Lord, and all of a sudden the Lord brought to mind a message I had preached almost to the day one year earlier. I was assigned a topic at a conference in Silsby, Texas to preach on the text that Jesus, uh, he gave up the ghost and he died. It was one of the seven sayings. He said, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost and died. And I preached and I remember when I was assigned that topic, I looked at that and I said, oh, Man, how am I ever going to get anything out of here for a sermon? I've never preached a whole sermon on that text. And I, I don't see how there's even... Well, when I got done studying it, my life was enriched. I wasn't able to Amen. finish the message at the conference. But the Lord had used that to prepare me. But I hadn't, I hadn't remembered it. So I got up in the middle of the night. I remembered that sermon. I went to my hard drive. I had taken my computer with me. went to my hard drive. I looked up that message. And one of the, the last point I gave there, Jesus teaches us how to die. Amen. And I, I read over those points that the Lord had given me, taken right straight from the text there, 
And I said to myself, Lord, this is how I want to die. I want to follow you to the yeah. end. Amen. And so I, I determined to do that. I meditated a while. My wife is in bed, and there I am behind my computer and, and thinking, well, perhaps Heather is going to come home here in just a few hours, and she's going to be a widow. Lord, I want to leave something that's an encouragement for my wife. And so for years we have, have sang and ministered to some a song that's called It Is Not Death to Die. And uh, with a beautiful message about, uh, 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 about death and really what a blessing it is to the believer and how it ushers us into the presence of God. And I got those words and I put them on the screen thinking I, I put the... The the, the, the the saver, what do we call the saver there um, uh, on the screen? The, the screen saver. Oh, that, that's profound. <laughs> I put the screen saver back home with that message, thinking my wife's going to come home and read that. And at least I'll have just a little bit of encouragement to her. Went back to bed, got up about 5 o'clock in the morning to make the trip to the hospital for preparations for the operation. And, and uh, we got down... We got down to the waiting, the, the last area before you go in towards the uh, the operating floor, and, and one of the doctors came to me and says, uh, "You know, you're probably not going to come out of this this operation alive." Had somebody told you that? And at that point, my wife and I, we were at peace with God. We were really, really just settled that the Lord's Lord's will would be done. And and uh, I said, "Yes, uh, we we were." Doctor Chobion told us that, and uh, we're, we're we're waiting and trusting in God. And so they pushed me back. I said goodbye to my wife. Pushed me back, and I don't know if you're like me, but when they put that that, that, that anesthesia on there, I want to fight that as long as I can, stay awake as long as I can. I don't like to give in that easy. But at the same time, I'm thinking on those points that the Lord gave me, and I'm I'm going checking the boxes off of, of the Lord's example and commending myself. I just thought I was going to close my eyes there, and uh, I was going to wake up and see Jesus. <laughs> the blue, the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And so, two and a half hours later, much shorter than they had, the, the, they had the prognosis. They they brought me back to the waiting area, and I went through the waking up process. And when I opened my eyes, I didn't see the Lord Jesus, and I didn't see the, the pearly gates, and I didn't see the glories of heaven, which really are beyond my own able description. But I looked up, and I was able to see. My beautiful wife. Amen. The doctor, they don't have a waiting room there for, for surgery, surgery, family of surgery patient. The, the family stays in the room where you're going to recover afterwards. And Dr. Chobion ran up the stairs and he said, he said, Senora Juanita, Senora Juanita, Brother Bert, Hermano Berto is the most lucky guy in the world. <laughs> And he said that repeatedly to her. And the next several days, every time we had contact or we saw him, he'd remind us once and again. And he said that because he said, your body encapsulated the tumor and it did not wrap around the carotid artery. It's Amen. Like the principal blood artery. It was like this. And all I had to do is stick something in there and break it. A little vacuum cleaner and they sucked it right out. Praise the Lord. So I said that wasn't that isn't the most lucky man. That's a man who is blessed of the Lord and who because of the prayers of that God's people, because Christ ever intercedes for me, this is the will of God. And uh, he had rejoiced. Maybe back up just about a week or two weeks before the surgery, knowing the seriousness of it, I wrote him a letter. And uh, I told him, I said, Dr. Chobio, I don't know what the outcome of this surgery is going to be, but I don't, no matter what happens, I don't want you to feel guilty. Right. I want you to know the will of God is going to be done. I am in the hands of the Lord, and there is a multitude of people that are praying for me. And to this day, he, that, that doctor just really, really highly esteems me. I just took all the pressure off him. He was just so grateful. He thought I was trusting in him. Thank you for the confidence. Berto, he would say, but he didn't know I wasn't trusting in him. I was trusting in God. Amen. And so the Lord, the Lord delivered me. And uh, sometime thereafter in the, in the healing process, some of the brethren began to say, Hermano Berto, 
What, what is the, why, why did the Lord allow this? You know, what has the Lord taught you through all this? Would you share some things that the Lord has taught you through this, this time, um, uh, this, this time of, of, of suffering, affliction, and uh, infirmity? And I'd just like to quickly, I don't have much time left, but I'd like to just quickly mention a few things here tonight. And I want you to look in Psalm chapter 119, verse 71. And I want you to see what the, what the psalmist said. My heart is in, in faith agreeing. He says, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, Amen. that I might learn thy statutes. And I want to say to you tonight, New Testament Baptist Church, according to his faithfulness, he afflicts us. And it's good for me, it's good for us to be afflicted. Amen. That we might ever learn humility and dependence. Learning humility is not an easy lesson. You're right. Man by nature is, is self centered, mm -hmm. and that from the earliest age. He's full of himself, he loves himself, he desires to please himself. He wants to pleasure himself. He considers himself wise and understanding. He exalts himself, and at the same time in his pride, he humbles and despises others. You know, apart from the regenerating work of God, the Spirit, man will never see himself as God sees him. Right? Never. Right. <clears throat> The Lord helps me, helped me to understand some of this as he was working in me through the story of Job. This is one of the most principal lessons of the book of Job, the necessity of an ever-growing humility in the life of the believer. It does not matter the maturity to which you have attained. Job was probably the most mature spiritually upon the face of the earth. But the book of Job, go with me there just for a brief second. Book of Job, chapter 38, please. The book of Job, <clears throat> having given us the deep details of his piety, of his, his, his spirituality, we see the great afflictions that come upon him. And the major part of the book is past seeing the reaction of Job, his, his, his dialogue with his friends. And, but the book closes. The book, the book of Job closes with an encounter between Job and God in which Job learns to humble himself before God. Yeah. Notice, if you will, please, Job chapter 38. And all the Lord goes along here, a whole list of questions, questions that are not easy to answer. But notice, if you will, uh, just briefly, uh, Job 38, 1 to 4, we see here, then the Lord answered Job. He had heard the voice of man. Now he's hearing the voice of God out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Right. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Amen. Declare, declare, Job, if thou hast understood. <laughs> Can you imagine asking a mere mortal man, even if he was 900 years old like Methuselah? Can you imagine asking a man, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Yeah. <laughs> okay, tell me, tell me, tell me there. The Lord would say to him, young man, I look at him and say he's an old man. He said, tell me, where were you? Well, where was your mother and father? Where were your grandparents? Where were your great-grandparents? Well, if you want to take it all the way back to Adam and Eve, where were they when I laid the foundations of the earth? Right. And every time, as God goes on here, and he dialogues with him, every time Job gets fulfilling his own insignificance, where were you? <laughs> You who are, are proud and lifted up. We go through the whole thing. Look, go through this whole four, four or five chapters here. Job chapter 40, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? 
He that reproveth God, let him answer. Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I'll not answer. Yea, twice, but I'll proceed no further. Amen. He said, I've tried to answer, but I realize I've just been foolish. I've just been out of place. I have nothing to say to you. You are 110% right, and I am always the insignificant. I'm a man. I'm Amen. nothing. Amen. I like, I like that man who said he, he, he was trying to describe the insignificance of man. The unworthiness. He said, I'm a zero. Yeah. But he said, I'm a zero with a line wrote down. <laughs> Think of that one. If I could draw a circle here, I'm a zero. He said, I'm a zero with a line wrote down. Mm. <laughs> then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I'll demand of thee. Declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment without condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thou thyself with majesty and excellence. Array thyself with glory and beauty. And he goes on to reason with him. And again, Job just continues to feel his insignificant. God helps him to see, in spite of his great riches, in spite of his fame, in spite of his utility among those of the Orient, and all that he had, he was still nothing apart Amen. from God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we could go through this whole section, but I want to jump now to Job chapter 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. Amen. That no thought could be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech you, and I'll speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth me. Wherefore, Amen. I pour myself and repent of dust and ashes. And I would submit to you that God is faithful in our affliction to teach us his statutes, the statute of humility, an ever-growing, maturing humility before the Lord. If Job needed that, I assure you that I need it. And if Job needed it, I assure you that you have need of that. Mm. Mm. Affliction conduces us to humility because it takes us beyond our control. We're not in charge of the circumstances, are we? Affliction conduces to humility because it makes us feel our weakness and our insignificance. Affliction conduces us to humility because it makes, because we can't find any solution in man and in man's resources. <laughs> Affliction conduces us to humility because it makes us to recognize and depend upon the mercy of God and His intervention. Affliction conduces us to humility because it, it empties us of, of, of auto-dependence, of being self-sufficient, and that we're not confident in ourselves. Affliction conduces us to humility because it, it destroys all human Wisdom, affliction conduces us to humility because many times it leaves us broken, mm -hmm. weak, many times even despairing, as Paul would say in the New Testament, despairing of life itself. And so David said it's good to be afflicted. Notice, if you will, in Psalm 119, verse number 67. Psalm 119, verse 67. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there, brother. Be patient with me. <clears throat> 119, verse 67. It's good for me to be afflicted that I might recognize my sin and I may amend my life. Notice what he says. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Right. And now I have kept thy word. <laughs> Affliction makes us, obligates us in the fear of the Lord to take inventory, inventory 
of all aspects of our life, spiritual, marriage, family, ministry, church, our laboring life, our public life. And we're taking inventory to see if there's some kind of inconformity, some kind of, uh, 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 of deviation, some kind of unconfessed sin that we haven't abandoned in our life. How can we not see the faithfulness of God if it requires affliction in your faithfulness you afflict us? If affliction serves as a means of discipline to correct our conduct, our life, our, 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 our way of living, should we not bless God for the affliction? Amen. Should we not? This is so vulgar in our society, but should we not see the rod of God, that rod that he uses to discipline us, Amen. just like that rod that we use to discipline our children? Should we not kiss the rod and say, you are the friend, my friend, and you come from God. Are you not a blessing? Amen. Oh, kiss the rod. Mm -hmm. Kiss the rod. It's good for me to be afflicted if it makes me acknowledge my sin and, Amen. It and confess it. It's good to be afflicted because in affliction we recognize again that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are so much superior to our ways. Amen. Which one of us would afflict our children? Like we see the afflictions that we mentioned in the scripture. How many of us, how many of us as a father would do that? Subject our children to that willingly. And yet God knows that that is exactly what we need. His You're thoughts right. are higher. His ways are so far superior to ours. Amen. What, why would we compare God? I, I'm a parent and I would never allow my children to suffer that. Well, that just tells you and me his ways are higher, his knowledge is greater. You're right. Amen. It's good for me to be been afflicted to understand that my days and my times are truly in the hands of God. If we had time, we look at Psalm chapter 90, verse 3 to verse 12. Where Moses says in that song, teach us to number our days that we may apply the hospitals. There's nothing like affliction will make us see the fragility of life and how quickly life can come to an end. Right. Oh, we ought to bless the Lord for affliction. If it'll make us heavenly minded, if it'll take our eyes off of earthly things and, and, and cause us to, to, to uh, uh, devalue the things upon which we set our affection and we set our affection on things that are above eternal things. Blessed are you, precious affliction, precious rod. And then last when we come, it's good for me to be afflicted to receive the consolation of God. Do you know God is God reveals Himself to be the God of all consolation? Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't think we Those of us who've been through sorrow, we're thankful for all the all, all the prayers and the attention, the help of our brothers and sisters. I remember when our daughter died back in 2000, 2004, and we had the service there in Oaxaca and People came into the service, the little casket there, a four-month-old day baby had departed this earth. And people came in to minister, came in to minister to my wife and my family and, and, and me, but they didn't have a clue what to say. They come up and they come with tears and wanting to say something. But you know, the Lord made me an instrument of consolation to them. Our Father is the God of consolation. Jesus said, I'm going to go, and when I go, I'll ask the Father to send you another comforter, meaning that Jesus is a comforter. The Spirit of God is a comforter. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Who oh, among us don't need to be comforted? Right. And so it's 2 Corinthians 
sem tud mondani. Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. What a blessed revelation. How would we ever know that? What a tender, what a gracious, what a kind, what a, 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 a comprehensive God we have who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort with, wherewith we ourselves are comfort of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. Mm. Do you ever wonder why it seems like those who are the, great, the most greatly afflicted on earth become the deepest, the deepest well saints that we know do you know why Edgar Harrell is such a blessing to me, brother? Because he's been in a great big pit and God has consoled and ministered to him and drawn him out. What a blessing he is. Amen. Christians today are so shallow. Yes. Not only because of our, our lack of time in the word and knowledge of the word and study of the word, but our experience is shallow. But those deep well Christians that we meet along the way, oh, they are so they are so blessed. They have an understanding. God has ministered to them in their need. God has come to them in their sorrow. God has wiped their tears. He's wrapped his everlasting arms around them. He's ministered to them. He's the God of all comfort. Amen. And we get in the presence of something like that. We say, wow. Well, I sure like to be like that. Mm -hmm. But you know what you have to experience to get that kind of knowledge of you gotta you gotta go through the school of affliction. Huh. Yeah. It's good for me to be afflicted to might receive the consolation of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're in affliction, you want some words of comfort, I invite you anytime to write or text me, to call me. I may not have the best answer in the world, but I know that God has ministered to me time and time again. He's been good and faithful with his word. Amen. God will do the same for those who will look to him. Amen. His word. Oh, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Mm -hmm. And so we find that Affliction, God in His faithfulness afflicts His own. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's the reason we ought to count our afflictions like David did. You've dealt well with thy servant. Mm -hmm. You have not sinned against me. Mm -hmm. You have not shortchanged me. Amen. You, 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 you have not cut a short corner with me. But I recognize you are good and you do good. In your faithfulness, you afflict. May God comfort the hearts of the saints here tonight. Perhaps you're going through a trial, a tribulation, something that this just meant personal need. But if it didn't meet a deep need tonight, you tuck it away in your heart right. and soul. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is going to come one day. Sure. And a balsam. Man. It'll be a sad. You'll rejoice. You'll rejoice. God is good. He's in affliction, in his faithfulness. He afflicts his own. May the Lord bless his word. Father, bless, we pray, your people tonight. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to learn the life of faith. Help us to trust your high thoughts and your high ways. Father, help us not to ever doubt. Help us, not, help us to be like Job, to not sin against you in time of trial. To not attribute to you, Father, foolishness. That, that you, without purpose, have sent these things into our lives. And help us to grow. Help us, Father, to repent. Help us, Father, to recognize our sin. Help us, Father, to be strengthened. Help us to be consoled. Help us to number our days. Oh, Father, minister to our hearts tonight. Father, before thee, speak to us from your word, we pray. Glorify Jesus Christ. Work in the heart of the unconverted here tonight. And Father, we pray that you call them to a life of following Christ, a life of blessedness. Not only on earth, but eternal, eternal bliss. Yes, Lord. In the presence of Jesus Christ forever. 
Thank you, Father. Minister to those who have broken heart tonight. And help them, Father, to really fall into your arms and rejoice and, and have joy that you are the great God of consolation. You comfort us in all our tribulation. Thank you. We do ask these things tonight. Bless the remainder of the service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Larry, thank you.